We have a special treat. We have Jordan Maxwell coming on the air with us, and it's a great honor. Jordan, are you there, sir? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to the show. We're so glad you could make it. It's, it's absolutely an honor to have you back here once again. Thank you. So where are we on anything? Where are we? Well, I wanted to bring you on specifically to start off with uh, a very deep question that I've always had and that I've noticed seems to be out there in the alternative research community. And you've done some fantastic work on looking at ast astrology and astrotheology, as well as ancient history, ancient religion, uh, geopolitics, etc. And I wanted to start off with the question. A lot of people bring this up because there seems to be a kind of a division taking place within the alternative truth community where some scholars look at what you see in a lot of these ancient texts, and there's many that we could cite that talk about visitation from advanced intelligences, etc. And some camps look at that as purely just some type of allegory, it's just astral theology, and there's no actual factual history to it. And then, then there's the other camp that thinks that every single thing written in these ancient books is 100% true in one way or another, and it's all factual history, and they disregard the whole concept of astral theology. So I wondered if we can maybe dig into this a little bit and try to help people understand some of the differences that are there, because I, I personally think that it's a little bit of both. But I wanted to bring you on tonight, Jordan, so we could see and get your take on that. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it is a mixed bag, uh, because... Uh, I, I, ha I have, first of all, I should say, I have no respect for science whatsoever. Um, there are a few scientists that I know of that are extraordinarily brilliant people that I have the highest of respect for. But science in general in the Western world, I have no respect for. They're like journalists or, or TV preachers, for them concerned. Yeah. Uh, scientists uh, are today, science itself, has become a religion. It's not. It's not scientific at all. It's a religion. It has its holy books. It has its saints, the holy saints. It has its gods, <clears throat> and uh, and you have to uh, bow down to the gods and to sprinkle incense on the altar and and you have to mimic whatever they taught you in school. You know to get your degree. Uh, so that you could become a scientist, and then of course, if once you become a scientist, uh, you're going to uh, uh, you know, mold your life all around. You're getting your money from the government and getting your um, uh, you know contributions from government to your college, and so that's how you pay your bills. And so naturally, uh, science will always cater to the powers that be to print the money and are in charge. You know, so it's very simple. It's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. And since the, you know, since the university is paying you as a scientist and the university is getting their taxes and everything from and tax relief and and uh, and their money from the big international banking cartels that are financing the university so that the university will teach you what the uh, international cartels want you to know and want you to understand and so you uh, you know you study hard at the university and you get a degree and that degree means that you now have a work permit. You can go out and get a job in, in your university or in some kind of an uh, educational institution and call yourself a scientist because you've got a work permit. It's called a degree from the university. And therefore, you can now uh, make enough money to you know, pay for your home and your car and your, your family. And so, not obviously, we wouldn't want to do anything to rock the boat and to cause any problems by you actually reading something and doing something on your own without anybody telling you and making some discoveries of your own by yourself and finding out that something is not true or well, if you find out something's not true you need to keep your mouth shut because you will lose your you know you'll lose your tenure at, and the college and university will fire you and uh, then you'll find yourself out in the street and then for the first time you will discover how useless your degree really is you'll discover how useless your degree really is when the when the powers that be decide that they've had enough of you 
Mm. You won't be able to get a job at Sears. I don't care how smart you thought you were. You know, the only reason why you are given a degree and are promoted is because you're promoting the, the party line. But if you happen to be extraordinarily brilliant uh, and you are learning things that nobody else knows and, and are trying to explain things to the world of science, well, we know we've already had too much, you know, 5,000 years of experience. The powers that be on this earth are not interested in science. They're interested in everyone being in compliance. So everyone believes what we tell them to believe, and if we and if we catch you teaching somebody something we didn't tell you, and it's like in the same thing with Christianity. You know, the King James comes out with a Bible that's called the authorized version. And why? Because he didn't authorize you to go reading anything else. <laughs> and so science is like a religion, <clears throat> while religion should be a science. Spirituality should be scientifically looked at, but it isn't. And so it's, it's relegated to TV show preachers and all that silly nonsense. But uh, spirituality, no one's, uh, very few people have ever touched spirituality. All kinds of people have religions, but very few people have ever really looked at the word spirituality, what it means. So when it comes to science and religion and government, I, I, I understand what's going on. It's all a game, and it's all commerce, it's all business, and if you don't go along with the, with the, uh, with the ideas that are being uh, popular right now, then you won't have a job. You're out. And I don't care if you got 14 doctors, it doesn't matter, you're out, you're finished, it's over. You don't, can't get a job anywhere. So uh, <clears throat> I understand how it works. When you're talking about where we come from and where the human race comes from, uh, there are overwhelming in your face <clears throat> facts of life that uh, scientists around the world know, but they're not about to talk about. Because I know I talk with a lot of different people, and, and, and you'd be surprised uh, how people react when you're talking to them by themselves. When no one's around, you're talking to them by themselves is one thing. But if you get them in a crowd or get them in a group at a restaurant where there's four or five others uh, in the same discipline, now the world, now it's different. So if you're talking to one lawyer over coffee or over a drink in a bar in the back part of the bar, just you and him, and you're talking, that's one thing. He'll tell you the real truth. But if you're going to have dinner with six other lawyers, and now you talk to him about it, it's going to be a whole different situation because he's not about to say anything that everybody else has already, or all the other lawyers know. We don't talk about that. And whatever that, that subject is, we don't bring it up and we don't comment on it. And everybody here at the table knows that. But if you talk to them by themselves, well, you know, late at night in a car parked out here on the, on the boulevard somewhere at night, that's when they'll tell you the real truth. So that's why I don't have any, uh, you know, any respect for scientists or religionists or government or any of the rest of these institutions because I know how they work. They all protect each other and they all have their own holy gospel and they all know what they're, what they're supposed to teach and... So nobody wants to rock the boat. Yeah. I mean, we're all on the citizenship, and so, uh, so I, I and so I, that's why I said I don't really have any uh, respect for on any of those sides of, of science. But having said that, there are some scientists that I consider to be absolutely mind-boggling, brilliant people, doing brilliant work. But most likely, you will never hear of them. And uh, because they're not out there on TV like uh, Billy Graham and <clears throat> TBN and dancing around the stage worshiping the Lord and making hundreds of billions of dollars a year, you know, entertaining uh, the poor people of the world with their all this silly nonsense religion, that's what you'll see. You'll see all the Benny Hens and all the uh, all the religious leaders dancing around the stage with their effeminate hairdos and their diamond rings, but they're not telling you anything. It's just a big act. Religion, at the end of the day, it's just business. That's what the mafia says. Nothing personal, it's just business. We're talking money. TBN, Trinity Broadcasting, we're talking money. Period. Millions a day. And so, you know, any any con man will tell you 
that if you're going to con someone, you have to find out what they like and what they don't like. And then you're going to con them by agreeing with them. Whatever it is they like, that's what you like. Whatever it is they don't like, that's what you don't like. And so you get their confidence because they like you because you're like them. No, you're not like them. You're a scumbag, but you are acting like you are, you are like them, and you are, are believe the way they do. Why? Because of money. You're ripping them off. And so that's why today people all over this country have lost their homes. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their income. They've lost their freedoms. Now the only thing left to lose is their minds. People of America are losing their minds because that's the only thing left to lose. They've been ripped off, lied to, cheated, and um, educated to be stupid. And the best you got is football or the reverends jumping around TV or football. And, uh, and the government is uh, going to rip you off. The churches are going to rip you off, and uh, banks are going to rip you off. I don't think there's anything out there in any institution that's not going to rip you off. So you better understand that the world that you live in is very, very evil and very, very dark. And I like what uh, what um, what um, what's his name Einstein said. Albert Einstein said the world is very, very dangerous. Not because bad people do bad things, but because good people do nothing. Yeah. So I understand how the world works. I understand it's all corrupt, and I understand that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so that's why today we're living in a world of absolute, total dictatorship, fascist uh, dictatorship of power. It has nothing to do with humanity. It has nothing to do with anything decent or holy, you know, all that stuff about uh, America being the land of the free and home of the brave and with liberty and justice for all. There is none of that. It's all God. Oh, God. It's only power. Might makes right. Period. End of sentence. Either you got the money or you don't. So, you know, I've always been interested in where did we come from? And what are we doing here right now, and where are we going? And I ask people all the time, where were you? I don't care, I'm not, I don't care about your body. What you need to realize is that your body is no different than any other human male body. Uh, you know, all men are designed the same way. All women are designed the same way. So there's nothing new about the female and the male body. <clears throat> and all human brains, whether it be male or female, adult or child, all human brains are human brains. You line them all up, 60 of them in a row, and you can't tell who they were because all brains are the same. And all bodies are the same. So what makes you, you? Well, your personality, your spirit, so to speak. Whatever it is, it's not your body, it's not your brain. It's who you are. Well, you are a personality, a spirit. So my question is, where were you 5,000 years ago? Were you around? Because you obviously are somebody. Where, where were you before you were you today? Where were you? And so that brings up the subject that you were talking about. How did we get here? Who created us? And all that kind of thing. Tonight, I am speaking with Jordan Maxwell, and we are very honored to have him on once again. He was so kind to come on and do the first show that I had on this network, and so I definitely owe him a debt of gratitude for that and for coming back on here and doing another hour with me. Uh, I couldn't be more honored. So we just started speaking in the beginning about some of the things that are going on on the planet, who's running the show, the fact that we have corruption and lies everywhere, the fact that everything has basically been turned into another of religion and collectivism where everybody can just believe what they're told and not really critically analyze information on their own and Jordan was also breaking down something very important which is that you know we need to understand who we are and, and not just look at our bodies as just some kind of hunk of meat that we are imbued with spirit we are connected and we do have a higher form of intelligence that we can connect to and eventually hopefully realize our full potential and Jordan we were just getting into 
the idea of our origins. And when we talk about origins, some people get confused because they think, you know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the physicality? Are we talking about the spirituality? And I think that when we talk about some of the things that are spoken of in these ancient texts, there's a little bit of both in there. And so maybe we can get into your take on, on, on maybe physically how, you know, what happened to the human race. I mean, we, we are connected and there are similarities within nature, but in terms of what Darwin was talking about, how we are just directly related to, you know, chimpanzees and apes, etc., there seems to be a lot more in terms of what a human being is physically than what uh, science has maybe given credit for. So maybe we can get into human origins there. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think it would be important to point out <clears throat> that Charles Darwin, which is interesting, a lot of people don't know this, that Charles Darwin never really wrote anything about evolution, period. And I just think that's interesting, uh, that uh, Charles Darwin is credited with uh, coming up with the idea of uh, origins of the species and all that kind of thing, and uh, evolution, etc. But in point of fact, he never wrote anything. Um, <clears throat> he didn't know much about it at all. Uh, the Charles Darwin family were very wealthy in England, and they uh, financed a young man named Wallace, Henry Wallace. And Wallace uh, was you know, fascinated with the idea that animals, uh, you know, have uh, reproduced themselves in different ways and that evolution, <clears throat> the whole idea of evolution was Wallace's idea. And so the Darwin family were interested in the subject, and so they financed him to travel around, uh, the, you know, all around to do his research. So Wallace was doing all the research, all the work, writing all the books, collecting all of these samples of all the butterflies and animals and <clears throat> insects. So Henry Wallace was doing all the work, but uh, the, uh, you know, but the, the, the Darwin family was financing him. And then one day uh, Wallace realized that he, he had gotten sick because he had gotten some kind of, a, of a influenza or something <clears throat> from roaming around the jungles. He had caught something which is easy to do, and was dying. And so he contacted Charles Darwin and the family and told them that he was dying and that they need to come quick and, you know, and pick up all of his work to protect it. And so Darwin went, um, came to him, I think it was in the uh, West Indies, and came over and got there in time before Wallace died and picked up all of his papers and books and all of his, uh, you know, all of his samples and, and on the glass and all that and brought it back to England. And since uh, Wallace passed away, well, he's already gone now, so who knows? So Wallace started publishing books as, uh, with his name on it when, in point of fact, he never wrote anything. It was Henry Wallace did it. That's an excellent book out. There's been actually two or three books out on the subject, you know, tracing this whole story. But one of them that uh, I think is the best of the group is called A Delicate, a delicate Arrangement. A Delicate Arrangement. The, the real story of Charles Darwin. Well, anyway, I was in, I don't know if you've ever heard of the work of, um, <clears throat> of, uh, wait a minute, <clears throat> Zachariah Sitchin. Oh, of course, yes. Well, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. I was actually in business with him, and I was one of the people who was sending him around the world, and I helped him get some of his books published, and and so, uh, you know, we were business partners at one time. So I had a lot of opportunities to sit and talk with him privately about his work and what what he knew that he hasn't told anyone. And, uh, I can tell you one thing. He, he did know a lot more than what he ever wrote. <clears throat> And uh, but we talked about this subject about you know who created us where do we come from etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my take on this is just my personal opinion, which has nothing to do with anything. It's just my view. I think that we are somebody else's experiment. Uh, my you know the book I read many many years ago back in 1959 was the complete works of Charles Fort. 
that was a very very important book to me at 19 years old it really it really turned my life around reading that book it's still available today you can get any any good bookstore you can order it it's called the complete works of charles fort f o r t charles fort very very interesting and important book <clears throat> But what Charles Fort said in the in the forewords of his book is he said he felt, he believed that we humans were somebody else's test tube. We were a, we was a test tube creation. Somebody created us. Well, that's what the Bible says, and uh, that's what uh, many many of the ancient texts from all the uh, Aztecs and Mayas, the Incas and Toltec peoples, and the Egyptians and the Hindus and God knows all the rest of the ancient cultures of the world. They all talk about uh, they who came here and created us. Now, I am of the opinion that we were created because logic alone dictates that, so that any time you hear someone calling himself a scientist who puts down the concept of creation, you need to understand that they're thinking in terms of Marxist-Leninism. They're thinking in terms of what we call Marxist-Leninist or communist philosophy, which says there is no God, there is no creator, not, period, none of it. The whole thing is on a bunch of bull. So therefore, <clears throat> you need to understand that the scientific community is usually, most often, uh, left-wing, uh, Marxist Leninist, uh, you know, we don't know that. We're not supposed to use those terms because people don't know what it means. But universities today in America are filled with left wing Marxist Leninist, Bolshevik, uh, social communists, etc., etc. And they have no regard for wisdom, knowledge, spiritual truth, intellectual, spiritual knowledge, and any, anything that has to do with the. Uh, with the upbuilding of the human spirit by knowledge, wisdom, and study, etc., they're not interested in. They're interested in only one thing, and that's international socialism, or what we refer to as the World Revolutionary Movement. I understand Marxist-Leninism. I understand the Communist Party of Russia. I understand what we call today the Republic and the Democratic Party is itself a Marxist-Leninist movement in America, but most people don't know that. <clears throat> I've studied it for 53 years, so I know what's going on. Therefore, I would say that for me, and it's just my opinion, and it's a subjective opinion, I am totally convinced that we were created by someone. <clears throat> and the reason why is the logic is very simple. If you were out in the middle of the, of the, of the uh, Sahara Desert, four days out, and you're hundreds and hundreds of miles from any civilization anywhere out in the real middle of the Gobi Desert or out in the middle of the Sahara, <clears throat> and you're roaming around, and you happen to see a watch uh, uh, laying on the ground, you pick up the watch, what does that watch do besides the time? The very fact that you found the watch out in the middle of nowhere should tell you if you have 500 brain cells or more all going in the same direction, it would tell you someone has been here. Obviously, the watch did not walk out here itself, and it wasn't created by God and dropped down from heaven. Somebody was wearing a watch, and it dropped it out here 300 miles from all, uh, in all directions from, from any civilization. But somebody was here, because here's the watch laying on the ground. And so when I look at the human creature <clears throat> and understand that one eye did not wait a million years for the other eye to evolve, no, the skull has two openings for eyes right off the bat. So we get two eyes to start with. And then you find out that all the other animals and all the other creatures, they also have eyes, two eyes. But what's that all about? All of a sudden, everybody's got two eyes. I thought we were evolving. How come one? Uh, well, how come some didn't evolve with six eyes, and one didn't? You know, so we all. Uh, so there's too much about the human body, the human nervous system, the human brain, the way it's all put together. It's way too complicated to have just by chance evolved. I don't remember who did it, but it was it was one scientist that had looked at this and said that the idea 
of a human body just coming together by you know the the miracle of of evolution and the fact that everything would have to be lined up perfectly would be like you know a, a tornado going through a junkyard and all the junk firing itself up into the air in that in that tornado and then coming back down into a perfect jumbo jet like it's the odds yep. are absolutely oh, staggering painted, impossible. yeah <laughs> yeah you're right because I like what one astronomer said. Uh, he was brilliant. He said the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. Yeah, we don't have the to imagine it just yet. <laughs> yeah, there are things going on on the planet Saturn today that people have no idea in the world, have never heard it. Stuff is going on on Saturn right now that you've never been told. Things which are found on the moon that you've never been told. Things which are being found on Mars that you haven't been told. And so I understand that uh, it's uh, this kind of knowledge, uh, hidden knowledge. I call it the occult world. Occult simply means hidden. And the hidden word of knowledge, hidden from. You know, we're always going to school and we have to take a test and never realize where the word test comes from. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and how that has to do with law. And, uh, it, it has to do with, with sex. It is really quite a subject when you start breaking down words and terms and ideas and where they've come from. But, uh, for me, I prefer, because I've only been looking at it for 50 years and I keep telling people I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I mean, I know how much I don't know. My God, there's the world of knowledge out there. You can sit on, you can go to any library in the world and sit and read till, till the day you die, and you need to come back 46 more times and not even scrape the surface of oh, what's in the, one library, much less the world's libraries. That's really the only way to gain any kind of knowledge in anything. I mean, because if you go out there with a preconceived notion of what something is, while you're looking into it, then you've got a biased opinion, and therefore you're not going to be able to really get down into what the truth of that subject would really be. So the type of um, mentality and the attitude that you're speaking about, about moving forward with that humble nature and understanding first, right off the bat, that there's a lot of things that we don't know, and we have to have that humility before we even try to seek these answers. Would you, well, of would you agree that that's really the best way to go about researching anything? Yeah, but you have to remember, if Al Capone and his mob are running Chicago, and you're a detective, you know, you've got a wife and children, and you're going to do, be doing research on, on organized crime in Chicago, <clears throat> well, if you think you're serving the people, you better go back and think about it. Because if you are doing research and you're putting your nose where it don't belong, you, you can get hurt that way. I mean, the bottom line is... Uh, well, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so this is why today the scientists and teachers who have been taught themselves in universities to get their degree so they can get a work permit, so they can go out and get a job, and they want merely uh, like a parrot. <laughs> like a parrot, they will tell you what they were told. They don't know. And all they know is what they took to test. They got a job, and they get a paycheck to teach you what their masters who taught them, what they wanted them to know. And now they're teaching you. So I learned a long time ago that uh, I'm not interested in what uh, <clears throat> important people tell me. I'll do my own thinking. Uh, so for me, I, it's, it's just my opinion, but when, I, when it comes to the subject of how do we get here, I've looked at all of the ancient texts, and I haven't gone through all of them. But I've looked at a lot, and I've been around for 53 years talking about it, so I've come to my own conclusions. We are here tonight with Jordan Maxwell, and we have one final segment left. And uh, Jordan, every time, or the last time we had you on, the same thing happened. The time flew by rather quickly, but we wanted to try to at least give people something to think about after tonight's show so that they can go and look into these matters more on their own time and what we were getting into there was some the concept of human origins and and your different your take and your opinion on that so maybe you could continue to expand on that line of thought yes 
<clears throat> after looking at all of the ancient writings of the world and the ancient scriptures of all the peoples of the world and traveling around the world and listening to and talking with astronauts and scientists and physicists and religious leaders, etc., etc., I've been doing it for many, many years, and I've come to the conclusion that there is something very legitimate about what's being talked about in the Old Testament of the Christian Jewish Bible. The Old Testament and Genesis, I believe, is hiding some profoundly important uh, information that very few people have even suspected is there. Because if you read it, you know from the from the King James version or any of the other modern modern day versions, you're not going to see it. But if you break it down and uh, into the occult understanding of the story, it's very overwhelmingly obvious in your face what the Bible is saying in the first few chapters of Genesis. Let me give you an example: as that in Genesis one one. It says uh, in the King James Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in the original. It doesn't say that. Because God in Hebrew <coughs> is El, E-L. El is God in Hebrew. But in Genesis 1-1, one, one, the word is not El. So you can't say it says God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Because the word is not El. It's Elohim. It's a totally different word. And so the Elohim is like putting an apostrophe S on the end of the word car. Car is one. Putting apostrophe S makes it more than one. Cars. So Elohim on the end of L makes it a feminine plural. It's a it's a plural, meaning more than one. And so the correct translation should be: In the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> and of course, immediately the Christians will say, "Oh well, no, that's that's uh, that's uh, God and Jesus Christ and uh, and the and the angels." No, no, no. We're talking Hebrew. We're talking the Jewish scripture. We're not talking the uh, nonsense that uh, that the churches are teaching about Christianity. This is Hebrew. And go back to the old Jewish writings, and it says, "In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth." Elohim is God in the plural. This would explain why in Genesis 1.28, when God is creating Adam and Eve, <clears throat> it says, God said, come let us, who's us? What are you talking about, us? Come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, Rabbi, there was a very famous rabbi many years ago. I used to talk to him back in the 60s and 70s. And he brought out to me back then, he said that there's no... No place in the Hebrew Bible does it say God created man. Nowhere. You can't find it. It doesn't say God created man. And I said, well, then explain that. And he says, well, what it actually says, and go back to Genesis one twenty eight. God says, come let us. Well, first of all, who is us? And then it says... Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And this is where Christians will say, well, see, there God is creating man. No, no. The word man in Hebrew is ish, I-S-H. It's pronounced ishi. I-S-H is man in Hebrew. But that's not the word that is used in Genesis 1.28. It's not God says, come, let us make ish. No, it doesn't say that. It says, come let us make Adam, not Adam. We just added an A to Adam and make it Adam. No, there was no Adam. It's Adam, A-D-M, which means something in Hebrew. But happily, we don't know anything about that, so we just call it Adam. No, it's not Adam. Adam, A-D-M, means something in Hebrew. So the scripture says, come let us make Adam after our image and after our likeness. And the rabbi told me, so what's being said here is, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. He's already here. But for being here, he's not that hot. So come, let us make him in our image. Let's make him in our image and looking like us. Well, that's different. Come, let us make man in our image means that man was already here. M-A-N, Ish, was already here. <clears throat> but somebody came here and saw Ish and said, Come, let us make man in our image. 
Therefore, they made something called Adam, which is a Hebrew word, which means something in Hebrew, for a new kind of creature. Therefore, we now know that <clears throat> we have hominid creatures. We call them hominid creatures that walked upright uh, like us. They had cranial uh, minds like I mean, had uh, heads like us, arms like us. They looked like us, but they were a little different. We're different from them because they were Neanderthal creatures. They were Cro-Magnon man, whatever you want to call them. They were ancient, ancient peoples. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, modern-day humans pop up with their, with their rock and roll music and lasers and television and walking on the moon and all the, all the high-tech sciences. Where did that come from? When, you know, we can go back into history and see that there was, uh, at the best of the best, was just hominid creatures who were hunter-gatherers and lived a very, very, uh, you know, very subdued life. And even before that, there were cave dwellers and, and ancient peoples. And all of a sudden, in history, pops up modern-day humans who are beautiful, profoundly wise, intelligent, um, you know, musicians and, and building great high rises and televisions and technology and going to the moon. Where did all of that come from? Well, because yeah, it seems some, like we really kind of don't even fit in here, really. Like that's we, we, exactly we, right. we have to live in perfectly controlled temperatures. We have to live in these, um, envi- like you know, we have structured environments. We have to have, uh, you know, all of these different things. We're kind of physically, we're kind of feeble. When it comes, when you compare us to any of the other things that are seem to be that's more that's exactly designed. right, no doubt about it. And so, where did we come from then? Uh, if uh, you know, where, where did we? Because our skin is thinner, we can't. The dogs and animals and cows they can stay out in forty below zero overnight, frozen. Everything out there, and the next morning they're still out there doing what they do. <clears throat> you try it. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, somebody recreated us and so that's why uh, in Genesis 9 the ninth chapter of Genesis after the flood of Noah's day God says to Noah and his family after the flood he says go forth multiply and replenish the earth well I talked to rabbis about that and they said to me look at and I asked him I said correct translation go forth multiply and replenish the earth yes why do you ask? I said, because the word is re, R-E, means do it again. Replenish the earth. Not plenish, replenish. And they said, well, of course, if there were people here and God destroyed everyone with a flood, then if you're going to have people on the earth, you've got to replenish the earth. Do it again. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So then I said, well, what about Genesis one twenty-eight when God is creating Adam and Eve? And it says... God says to them, uh, let us create man in our image, after our likeness, and go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Is that the same word? And he said, yes. I said, well, then why does it say replenish when it's creating Adam and Eve? And he said, because the Adam and Eve are not the first humans on the earth. The earth has had humans here for millions and millions of years. Millions of years there has been intelligent creatures and intelligent life forms on the earth. We are just a new creation. That's what the Bible is telling you in Genesis, a new creation for, the, for this particular dispensation, for this particular time in the, in the march of human history. We are now humans. We are human, but before we were Neanderthal man, cro man. Now we're human. We are a different kind of creature that has been divine, divinely designed. Somebody came here a long time ago and saw the indigenous creatures here that we call hominid creatures, and science agrees that there were such things as hominids that, well, that looked like us, we, well, in our minds, almost like the cavemen. And then somebody came here, the Bible says, and said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so they created us. Now we are like them, and that's what the scripture says in the Bible. It says, the God then says, the gods, Elohim, more than one. The gods said, look what you have done. Now man has become as one of us. You know, we're crazy, and we got total power, and we can do all crazy things. And thing, uh, crazy things. Well, look at man. He's building rockets and atomic bombs and 
and killing people. He's like us. Look, man has become as one of us. He's like us. He looks like us. He talks like us. As a matter of fact, his women are beautiful, so we're taking some of them for our, for our wives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, yeah. and people can also look at the amount of evidence. Like, this isn't just only reading this in the ancient scriptures. And uh, as Jordan pointed out, this is in uh, you know virtually any ancient civilization you look into. They talk about these types of things, and they all might have their different take on it and their different story, but it's really pointing ultimately to the same thing.